Yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I think one of the hopes would be to use the neuroscience to be able to individualize the educational approaches. So can we look at a brain and say, this brain is ready for calculus. You know, this one isn't yet. And, and this is a, you know, a time when the brain is you know, ready for languages or social interactions. Because there's so much individual variability you know, in terms of, of when people you know, reach puberty, for instance, but even you know, walking, talking, all, all of those things. But it's, it's been elusive. And since the early 90s, we've been able to tell if somebody knows long division from, this, from the scanner. You know, they don't even have to listen at you. Just show them the picture of the little house with the numbers. And if they know long division, you can tell how they process it for about you know, $600 or for, two, or for two cents, right? You can just give them a piece of paper and a pencil. And, and so far, almost everything fails that test. There's lots of neat things we can do, like, oh, next week you're going to remember this word from John Gabrielli's work and stuff. But nothing so far that's going to get where close to cost effectiveness. Everything so far that I know of, maybe something newly emerged at this conference, you can find out the same thing cheaper and, and even better. Uh, just one more example on that. I, 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 a judicial system, a 12-year-old who stole the car when the police came you know, to arrest him, he kicked the officer, he ran off. They wanted to do a brain scan to see if he's impulsive. And I was like, that, that's, that's backwards, right? Because like, what he did was impulsive. And that, but people in their mind, even something like that, they think, oh, if only we had a picture to, to prove it. Um, and, and I think that happens a lot. Uh, one other thing I'll say about that is that, you know, stu th the way we figure these things out is we, we tend to think that there's uh, some sort of norm, normal, normative seven-year-old, eight-year-old, nine-year-old, and that's how we develop our educational system. But really, it's that variability around the norm that's going to tell us more. And I agree with Jay that we're, we're a long way. Yeah, just give him a piece of paper and a pencil. It'll tell you more quicker. Um, but at the same time, I think that these, these sorts of efforts might, you know, using the work that we're all doing might help us, even if, even if we're back to a norm 8, 9, 10, 12 year old, it might help us come up with at least a better idea of how to educate them, right? Even, even if we're back down to the, to the norm. But understanding brain and development and cognition might help us inform the educational system sooner than having a scan tell you what, whether the kid can do calculus or not. Yeah, hi, guys. So uh, I, I just want to uh, put out an idea for also tomorrow. And, and I, I'm going to make the same mistake, and, and that's a trap into which I think we are all falling in uh, implying that something biological is driving uh, brain development, that there is a set timetable that varies, of course, uh, of course across individuals, but, but that set timetable set maybe by our genes is kind of inevitable. And, and I'm just, uh, I just want to uh, ask you, uh, you know, what about the environment? What about our experiences? How are they shaping and changing those timetables? And, and go back to <coughs> the beginning of your talk, Jay, when you said that, well, adolescence is, uh, humans have this enormous, enorm enormously long period where we have the luxury of developing our brains. Has it been the case two year, 200 years ago? I doubt it. I think that we went out uh, to work uh, by the age of 14. And was our prefrontal cortex developed at that age to the same extent that our prefrontal cortex is now developed at 25? If so, it cannot be in our genes. It must have been the external pressures that really shaped the brain. So what do you think? Well, I mean, I, that, that's, you know, kind of the heart of, of where we are, that everything, I mean, why, why do all this stuff if we didn't think somehow we could tip balances back to get people healthy? Like, can, can you do some sort of intervention that will alter the connections in the brain that, you know, cure, cure autism, for example? But, I mean, that's kind of how I think of it. It's all about what's going on out here that's shaping what's in here. 
You know, I, I'm hoping that the twin work that you're doing and I'm doing and other people are doing might help you know, with that somewhat in terms of at least kind of gives some wide constraints in terms of, of the environmental influences. And, and they are fast in terms of these changes. But I think that there's a lot of convergence historically that even 14, 16, like a lot of cultures when you could kill your own food, that you were an adult or you know, grown up and could have your own hut and family and such. But, but that on almost all of them, I know for like the Native American um, nations and stuff, there was this notion though that even if you could be the best warrior or do other things, until around 25 or 30 you weren't given leadership positions. You weren't sort of the elder, or even the word elder, I guess. But I mean, there's so many convergence from you had to be 25 to be a gladiator in Rome if you were a citizen. So it sounds like a terrible thing to want to be, but actually it was kind of a cross between rock star and great athletes, very rarely lethal and stuff. But um, I mean, throughout, I mean, there's a lot of, um, of uh, from millennia of different cultures and stuff, this notion that we get something maybe, you know, loosely called wisdom. Uh, with age, and maybe it's just added experience um, that goes along with it. But I think things like um, delay discounting and impulse control um, continue to get better and better um, throughout the second into third decade, even if you have, you know, your a job at 14. But I, I don't, you know, have evidence uh, to uh, support that directly. But that's my hunch. Yes. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. The only the mechanism uh, would come to mind would be um, a, um, no go and some of these other um, molecules released by myelin in terms of so you have a trade off of more myelin less arborization um, from from Doug Field's work but uh, it's you know mice and uh, early. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could provide some insight into way that, the way that you think about how um, these structural changes might uh, influence and modify and shape functional changes. Um, so I guess the two-part question I have is one from a sort of pragmatic measurement perspective. Um, given these staggered structural changes, should we incorporate and think about them when we're interpreting, for example, changes in functional MRI measures that vary with age, which may be co-varying of course, with structure, uh, structural differences. Um, and the other part of the question is more sort of in terms of interpretations. So um, we talk a lot about increased efficiency um, in global integration and so forth, but it's not immediately clear and people seem to have different ideas about how that might manifest in terms of functional signals. And I was just curious what your in perspectives were on that. Um, well, You're closest. Yeah. No, one thing I think about, because I do a lot of functional and structural, and I, I hear from people, well, you have to control for cortical thickness in order to interpret the signal that you're seeing on fMRI because it's given rise from the cortex. Um, the example I've used for years and years and years is, you know, if you have a patient with um, Huntington's disease and you are measuring, measuring activity in the caudate, and you say, oh, there's no activity in the caudate. Well, there is no caudate, right? So it's a, it's a trade-off. I mean, I think that the things are related. Some questions, um, clearly the Huntington's question, if it's not there, it can't give any signal. But at the same time, I think that they're looking at relationships between the two is more interesting than saying you have to control for one in order to interpret the other. I mean, I think coming back also to Thomas's question, I think that, that that's the reason that we got involved in trying to do a lot of the structural D, uh, DTI studies was to try to use this structural inferences to determine whether it was linked to differences in performance. And we got started in a, a, um, in a reading study in, in, in children trying to follow up from some work from Torko Klingberg. Um, and, and so I think it's trying to measure the horsepower uh, you know, under the hood and then whether it gets you know affected by a better mechanic or worse mechanic or whatever i think that um that's what we're trying to attain and i think at least uh the current methods we have now at least provide us some quantitative metrics that we didn't have before 
And it may be that trying to look at uh, specific, re you know, we just don't know. Specific regions are too simplistic. You know, that tract alone is going to link to reading or math or whatever. Um, or everything together is going to link to something. I mean, there's probably going to be something in between, but trying to sort it out all out with just one modality, DTI, let alone coupling in all the cortical thickness and fMRI and everything else, I think that's going to take probably other expertise. The structure function works a lot better at the micro level. And we can actually you know, see uh, receptors and, you know, at microscopic level, then it's almost, you know, like predictable. But even at, at the voxel level, it starts breaking down in terms of, and I think maybe if we get, you know, better resolution, but, but if you read the literature, like the patient group part's bigger, like, oh, it's like, oh, they're, you know, like, it's compensating. Oh, okay, it's smaller. Oh, it's broken. You know, it, every, you know, every finding has some, you know, explanation. And so it gets a little dissatisfying when you can have it both ways, you know, um, so much. And for things like IQ, then what we find bigger is better at one age, smaller is better at another age. So a, a lot of it, I think, has frustrated a lot of us in terms of, uh, uh, I think it's, you know, there at some, you know, at some level, uh, form ever follows function. But it's been a lot more elusive than we would have thought in terms of, uh, I, and I think it may be because we're not looking at a, a microscopic enough level. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciated that in all talks there was this attempt to look at the developmental function um, across a wide age range and to sample very frequently. And, um, and I love the idea that the environment plays a role and also the idea that, that in adolescence what's happening is this sort of weaning period. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that always strikes me is that in the first sort of really important burst in brain development happens in the first couple of postnatal years. And it is also dependent on the social interaction with caregivers, but it's a very different type of social interaction. It's that initial attachment interaction. And, um, and I wonder if you would be willing to speculate or if you have data from your own labs about how that might change the quality of those attachment and the quality of brain development at that time point might change the, the function, the trajectory that we're looking at. It might even interact with stress hormones later on, et cetera. Um, I know it's a, it's a really tough question from an imaging vantage point, but if you have um, any ideas, I'd love to hear them. Well, yeah, I think in terms of the, the most critical times for brain development, it might get a bit of what Tom was saying. You know, the, like it's, every circuit sort of has this moment in the sun, you know, in terms of that different ages or, you know, different, I think, you know, sensitive periods for, for different circuitry. Um, and so the ones that tend to um, come online and mature first are the, the five senses, uh, um, sight, touch, sound, uh, smell, taste, and, and then followed more by the association areas and then the higher association areas. And it also follows, uh, um, in twin studies, a heritability pattern. So the, those circuits that mature first and earliest also have the highest heritability early in life and less so in later. Um, but I think that the, the, it's the timing is really the key to understanding this in terms of, and it's going to be, I think, more meaningful at the graph theory level um, to, to find, like, the, uh, you know, cha changing uh, uh, network characteristics. Uh, so I think that that's uh, the way to go. Um, from a white, white matter DTI point of view, people have been studying infants and babies and neonates and, you know, that have very specialized setups to be able to study healthy babies and scan them uh, with the DTI protocols. And they, and they do show that the greatest increases um, in those white matter tracts is in those first two years of life and then it starts petering off at four and uh, at four years. And then if you look at the plots, they give you the impression that it ended, but then, you know, all the studies that everyone else has done since then has shown that, no, no, it, it's, it's still going up, but just not as much, and then it levels off at some point, and then eventually starts to go downhill. Um, so I think there, there is a lot of literature that suggests that uh, that early period, of, of course, is where a lot of brain development is happening. I guess the problem is, is trying to link that up with later outcomes. So maybe in 10 years, those labs, or 15 years, those labs are going to come out with some really great papers saying, here's all the metrics we had when these were babies, and now they've developed this disorder or that disorder, or they're all healthy, or they have this different levels of ability, and we can point back to that, that time point. I wanted to just bring up one more, okay. 
go back to a bit of uh, Thomas's question about the importance of the environment. And uh, what I really liked about all the talks today is you show these nice uh, developmental trajectories of what's normal development, whatever we agree on. And I could imagine coming back to this conference in a few years and now seeing splashes across, this is the abnormal development in ADHD or the abnormal development in autism or so on. But coming back to the, the concept of the environment, and do you see it that we could be sitting here in a few years and, and you could put a graph up there and say, this is the abnormal trajectory we got now because of something happened in the environment. Now, I, I know Christian's there, so I know you can do that already, we say with fetal alcohol syndrome where it's in utero, but I'm thinking more of factors that emerge after children are born, socioeconomic status, or if the, they uh, suffer extreme social pain through bullying or something. And would, do you see the day coming when you can put the trajectory up there and say, there's the normal one, there's where the white matter or the gray matter or the size of the amygdala or something diverted because this happened in the environment? Yeah, well, definitely, I think within populations, a lot of, of that is going on. Christian with fetal alcohol and Jay with ADHD and, and, and a lot of other disorders and myself as well. Um, yes, we are seeing, you know, in fetal alcohol, we know when the damage happened, right? So when you see a different trajectory, it's not because of the damage that happened in utero, it's because differences within the environments of, of those kids or, the, or those behaviors. As far as taking an individual, again, br bringing it to an individual and taking a scan a year for every, you know, every year for 10 years to say is this individual, is, is their trajectory predictive of their environment or, you know, the flip side of that coin? Did their environment cause this trajectory? But, but I think we're really moving in those lines already in terms of how disorders and socioeconomic status and so. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the plots, even just of the white matter, I mean, the scatter is humongous. So if we didn't have 200 subjects, you'd be a hard pressed to pull out a lot of those exponential curves, depending on who you happen to have recruited for your study. Um, so at a given age, you can find a 60 year old that has the same, you know, the same FA as a five year old. And so on. So there's 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 definitely a lot of scatter, and we don't understand the scatter, and we haven't had the funding to be able to measure testosterone and measure other, you know the entire life experiences. And even if you did, uh, how accurate would a lot of those reports be? I mean, it's a big problem in the fetal alcohol um, world is to try to figure out. Okay, most of these kids have been in other placements, other homes, adoptions, and and so on. What's happened to them all their life? Is is it just because of an early yeah, insult? Yeah, I mean, I think those are, that's what people are trying to do, but they're extremely challenging to get that type of data robustly and, and, and accurately. I think one of the best sort of proof of principle um, um, things on this, you know, does what we do matter for those trajectories, is probably music, which is you know, one of the most amazing things we do. Right? People spend ten, you know, tens of thousands of hours practicing a musical instrument, you know, dedicating you know, their life to doing it. And, I thought, man, if we don't see something here, you know, we're, we're d dead in the water, right? Um, so, I mean, it is extreme, right? People, you know, many hours a day practicing, you know, something not necessary for survival kind of thing. And so, uh, you know, for what it's worth, we do see, right? We can tell musicians from non-musicians uh, bilateral you know, versus unilateral. So there is signal there, um, uh, and at least, at, you know, at these extremes. Um, and if we hadn't found that, then I would be, you know, very pessimistic, but we did.